So the way Murakami decided to do this book is he showed all the Kafka stuff first, followed by the Nakata stuff. Um, and I think I talked about this early, earlier, but these two diverging lines, although they happen simultaneously, he writes about them in different parts of the book. So they don't happen at the exact same time. So the, the entire build of the second half of the, I mean, the first half of the book uh, ends with these, with when you finally realize that these two things come together. Uh, I'm going to go over first what Kafka is doing, then what Nakata is doing. And then I'm going to talk about um, the fact of, of how they're connected, which I'm going to do earlier than it happens in the novel, just so that we can talk about it and understand it. So we start with Kafka, and he's been hanging out at the library uh, day in. He's been reading, I think, Soseki Natsume. I can't remember what else. Yeah, I think he's just been reading uh, Natsume, uh, who's a, an early Japanese writer. He did a novel called Kokoro um, and Moan and a lot of different other really uh, well-known Japanese stories. Well, I'll probably look at him later on in the channel eventually. But... We start a chapter, very jarringly, of just him waking up, and he's in a place, he doesn't understand where he is, he's laying on the ground, and my first thought was he's gotten into a fight and got a concussion somehow and doesn't remember what's going on, because his shoulder is in immense pain, and he's l looking around for his stuff, and he eventually gets up and find his finds his stuff under a tree. He realizes that he's in the in the grounds of a shrine, a Shinto shrine, and he's not sure how he got there. Um, but apparently, this isn't completely abnormal. This has happened once or twice in his life. And the way he kind of explains it is: there's times when he would suddenly feel like he was going to pass out, and then would get into a fight with somebody or something there's this violence that comes out uh, in him that he's not 100 percent aware of so he's looking for another person like did i get into a fight did i hurt anybody like what's going on so eventually he collects all his stuff and he goes into the bathroom and he's washing himself up and he notices that there's blood on his shirt and this chills him to the bone he's terrified that he's killed somebody so he takes off the shirt and tries to wash the blood out it won't come out he just puts that in his in a ziploc bag in his backpack there's still blood on the shirt underneath that but it's a darker shirt so you can't really tell so he, he gets all cleaned up gets out of there and uses the, his dad's cell phone which I, I talked about he took um, his dad's cell phone earlier when he left he uses his dad's cell phone to call sakura and she's confused of course because it's late at night and and he wakes her up she says okay come come over or meet me at this convenience store and, and we'll go to my house so he meets her he gets in a cab the cab takes him there he meets her and they go upstairs to her room, I mean, to her apartment. And it's an apartment, it's somebody else's apartment that she's taken care of for a few months. And Kafka tells her everything. I think everything except for he doesn't tell her about the Oedipal curse. But he tells her everything about even passing out in the blood. And, and Sakura is an interesting character because, like, she doesn't have any reaction to any of this. Like, if somebody comes into your house with blood on their shirt and says, oh my god, I'm afraid I killed somebody, you're going to have some kind of reaction, and she has absolutely none. I think Murakami wanted to write the essence of what he feels like a sibling would be. And it is important to note, because sisters come up a lot in Murakami's writing, it is important to note that Murakami is an only child. He didn't have any siblings. Um, so I think he has this kind of obsession with the kind of love that a sibling would, would give um, that can only come 
from the heart of somebody that doesn't have siblings. Uh, I know that's terrible to say. And I make this this channel with my brother, and I absolutely love my brother. We've been great friends for most of our life. But anybody that has siblings know, uh, in the beginning, it's not all fun and games, right? It's not always unconditional love. That's something that, that grows uh, with time from a family. And I don't want to say that people that are only children, my daughter's an only child, uh, I don't want to say that, that people that are only children can't understand what it means to have siblings. Because people that are only children can have friends that are around all the time, cousins, so on and so forth. Um, I just find it very interesting, specifically uh, when I look at the Japanese culture, the concept of the relation of the way they 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 view relationships between siblings if you look at anime there is this entire genre of anime that is about people in love with their siblings and it seems like a sexual way uh and every time i see any anime like this at all um my first thought is anybody that could write that doesn't have siblings uh, just because I, I, I find it impossible for, I, I find it impossible that those people can understand what it means to to have a sibling and write about it like that. The only reason I'm, I'm harping on this is because of what's coming up. Anyway, I think that Sakura is Murakami's view of a perfect, unconditionally loving sibling. Uh, and of course, part of... Kafka's Oedipal curse is that he's also going to sleep with his sister. This is not true in the original Oedipus uh, story. This is something that Murakami added. So, um, I think way back on the bus, he asked if Sakura was adopted, and I think she said, no, I, I, I know my parents. So she can't be his sister. I think it's pretty firmly established that she is not his sister. But um, they're starting to feel this sisterly love um, sisterly brotherly love for each other uh, and we know Kafka's all messed up in the brain about that so she helps him uh, she helps him out and uh, lays down and makes a bed for him in the room there it's a very small studio apartment and eventually she tells him that she has a boyfriend so they can't have intercourse, but calls him over and um, gives him a hand job, And it's the weirdest moment. And this is one of those moments that a lot of people are wondering why it's in there. Although, this is not the sex scene that I see talked about the most in this book. Which surprises me because Kafka's only 15 and, and Sakura's an adult. So this, this surprises me. I, I figured people would, would be talking a lot about this scene. But they have a tendency to talk more about the later scenes where um, Kafka is uh, assaulting people while they sleep. And we'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, this is a very interesting scene. And right afterwards... She says, it would be really nice if I could be your sister. Which is, I would assume, the last thing anybody would want to hear after something like that. Uh, but that is what she says, and he agrees, yes, that would be very nice. Now, I do want to bring up one point that is about the alien storyline, if or the alien interpretation. While he's talking about his father to Sakura, he tells her that his mother left when he was four and took their adopted sister. So the, the sister's adopted. Um, and that hurt him even more that his mother took the non-blood related sibling and left her blood relating si related sibling with her father, uh, with his father. And Sakura has the strangest line and it's on page 89 in my copy. And she says, It sounds like your father is an alien that came to Earth just to have a baby. And that is the most specific throwaway line ever. Because it really pins some stuff down. And we find out later that 
uh, Kafka's father is very much connected to the bad guy of this story who could possibly be an alien. We'll get into that later, but I just wanted to bring that up so that it's out there when we talk about uh, Kafka's father later. So the next day, Sakura has gone to work and he cleans her apartment and leaves her a note thanking her for everything and leaves. He goes back to the library and talks to Oshima and... Uh, Oshima kind of pulls information out of him about what he's what's happened, and uh, Oshima finally says, "You know, you can you can stay here and work in the library. We could use extra help in this library." And Kafka really likes that idea and would love to work in the library. Oshima says, "Yeah, that that can be worked out, but first I have to talk with Miss Saiki and make sure that she's okay with it." and this can't really happen for the next couple of days. So I have a cabin way out in the forest that my brother and I own. Uh, I'll take you up there. You can stay there for a few days and then I'll come and get you when uh, it's time for you to stay here at the library. And so Oshima drives Kafka up to this cabin. On the way up there, they talk about Soseki Natsume and they also talk about Schubert. They're listening to a Schubert symphony. Is it a symphony or they're listening to a Schubert piece in the car ride over there. I believe what they talk about is the responsibility of imagination. I can't remember exactly that part. That might be worth going back and, and looking at. Um, but anyway, Oshima leaves Kafka in this cabin way out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Uh, and before he leaves, he tells Kafka, hey, don't go out exploring in the forest because it's almost supernatural how easy people can get lost in the woods around here. And Kafka is scared the first night in the cabin. Um, and there's a bunch of books in there. So the next day he just kind of lays around and reads about a, the, uh, a Nazi war criminal. There's a book about this Nazi war criminal. And it says exactly who it is. Uh, and I can't remember, I'm sorry, but anyway, he reads about this Nazi war criminal and wonders to himself if he is just as bad as that Nazi war criminal. Now, that's, of course, a false analogy, but he is thinking about the fact that he might have killed somebody. He doesn't know what happened at that shrine uh, where that blank is in his memory, and he's wondering if he's done something super terrible, and he's terrified and I feel really bad for him at this point because I think it's easy for us to forget that this is a 15-year-old kid that's dealing with a lot of stuff that is is traumatic for somebody of his age to go through. He actually starts to wonder at one point if his imagination can affect the world. I think that connects to the talk about Soseki Natsume in the car. Uh, he, he has this kind of magical realist thought that maybe what he imagines actually happens. Um, and he's connecting that to the concept of the Oedipal curse and the death of his dad. But his dad's not dead, so it's all just kind of him thinking and, and wondering. Of course, Oshima warned him not to go walking around in the forest, so that's exactly what Kafka does. He goes into the forest and it's incredibly eerie. This is the kind of stuff that Murakami really does well. Because when, when it, it, it sounds ridiculous when I just say it out loud, he walks in, turns around, and he can't find the trail, and he, he almost gets lost. And he feels like a city boy in the forest, right? He has no idea kind of how to find his way back. But there is an oppressive fear of the magic of this fort forest, the supernatural prowess of this forest that Murakami is able to invoke through his writing here that is absolutely incredible. But luckily, Kafka makes it back. He sleeps another night there, reads more about the Nazi, and then again the next day goes out into the forest. And this time he's very careful about where he goes. And he ends up getting... Uh, far enough in that he finds a clearing and he's, he lays in the clearing and feels like the place is very special. And I really like this concept. I remember when I was a kid, I found 
a place in Salt Lake City, um, an area out in the middle of nowhere outside of Salt Lake City, uh, and it felt like a magical place to me. And that's, I think, I think we can all feel that at times, but the way that, that I connect this feeling is to something that only youth can feel right the the childhood wonder of discovering a place that feels like is magic and you're the only person that's been there and i think that that's kind of what this moment of the story talks about he goes back to the cabin and his brain is obviously trying to figure out his feelings around what happened between him and sakura uh, and this was important to me that that Murakami put this in the novel because we are dealing with somebody that is just barely uh, experiencing a sexual awakening. And I think that that could get lost easily. Um, this isn't something that just happened to Kafka that he can forget about and move on. Uh, that moment to him is very hard to understand and he's trying to figure it all out and he gets an erection but decides not to to masturbate um and and goes to bed and all of that seems very much like a teenager right before he he falls asleep he thinks about the responsibility of dreams and i think that that is connected again to soseki natsume yeah, are we responsible in dreams? And, and it's important that this comes up this early because it will become very important later. The next day, Oshima picks up Kafka and they drive back to the library. One of the first things that they talk about is the strangeness of his experience there. And Oshima says something really interesting. He says, nature is kind of a natural and relaxation can be threatening. And I love this line. Nature is kind of unnatural. And of course, as we as a species have moved from being connected to nature to trying to build shelter to stay out of nature, to build towns to stay out of nature and cities to stay out of nature, you get this concept that nature can be seen to humans unnatural. The best example I can think of this is the some of the oldest literature in the world, the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? Um, I forgot what Gilgamesh's friend's name is, but, but he starts as this nature creature, half man, half animal, right? And the whole thing is kind of a metaphor for how terrifying nature becomes to humans once they move into a city out of it. And the concept that re relaxation can be threatening is, I think, something instinctual within us. Uh, that if we try to relax for too long, to lay around for too long, our emotions start to get to us, right? We feel guilty for, uh, for relaxing for too long. Relaxation can be threatening. I just thought that was really brilliant. Uh, Oshima tells Kafka that Kafka wants something but is also running away from it and that it's a complete contradiction. Uh, and I like that concept that, that Kafka seems to be, and it's in my opinion about the Oedipal curse, uh, that he seems to be running simultaneously towards it and away from it, uh, which, which I think is very smart of Oshima to point out. Oshima brings up Cassandra, princess of Troy, who is given the ability to prof prophecy. Prof I was going to say prophecy, uh, and uh, and also is cursed with the uh, is is given the curse that nobody will believe whatever prophecy she makes. I don't know if, she, if Oshima is connecting that to himself or to Kafka. And they head back to the library. Okay, that that is all the important parts surrounding Nakat or uh, um, Kafka heading up to, from from the murder to the next section. The way I'm breaking this up. So now we're gonna backtrack and we're gonna go back to Nakata. And again, remember in the novel, all this Nakata stuff happens way after all this 
Kafka stuff, but they're happening simultaneously. So Nakata goes to the vacant lot where the cats told him Goma sometimes shows up and where the evil man shows up and just sits there. And he does this for a couple of days, just all day, just sits there. And eventually this big, scary dog walks up to him and he hears a voice in his head that says, follow me. And Nakata cannot talk to dogs. So this voice in his head surprises him. It's very surprising. But he does. He follows the dog. And the dog takes him to this neighborhood house. And he goes into the house. And he meets uh, a man in a top hat and a vest, I think. And the guy's like, hey, it's me. And Nakata's like, I don't know who you are. And the guy's kind of confused. He's like, I'm Johnny Walker, who, of course, is connected to whiskey. Um is a huge, huge mascot and somebody that everybody should know is what Johnny Walker feels like. Um, But Nakata doesn't have any idea, not a drinker. And Johnny Walker is very strange and eventually pretty quickly comes out and says, hey, uh, I'm glad you're here. I want you to kill me. Uh, I, I, I I need to be killed. And Nakata's like, no, I, I don't want to kill you. Nakata's never killed anybody. He's a gentle soul. He doesn't want to do that. Um, he says, I'm just here to get cats. Right, do you have this cat, Goma? Um, and Johnny Walker's... Uh, the dog gets up and... Uh, Johnny Walker says, follow the dog. And he can hear the dogs, or he can hear a voice in his head coming from the dog, but it's actually Johnny Walker's voice. Um, Again, the minute we get to Nakata is where the real magical realism uh, takes place, truly, in this book. So the dog's like, follow me, follows the dog into the kitchen. Dog says, open the refrigerator. Or is it a freezer? I think it's the freezer. He opens the freezer and there's all these cats' heads lined up in the freezer. Now, just a quick warning. Uh, this next part of the book and this next part of the video is going to get real gory. Nakata doesn't comprehend or express emotion in the same way that the people around him do. Uh, so he's he's... He's really hyper-focused on finding Goma. So he doesn't really react to the cat heads. He just starts looking through them to see if any of them are Goma. So none of them are. So he shuts the door and he says, none of these are Goma. And in his head he hears, yeah, that's not that's that's true, which means Goma's got to be here with me. So he goes back into the room and Johnny Walker's like, I need you to kill me. And I need you to be full of rage when you do it. And the ability to bring that out in Nakata is impossible. He doesn't experience rage the same way other people around him do. Um, So what Johnny Walker starts doing is pulling cats that he has paralyzed with some kind of injection, starts pulling them out of the bag and cutting open their chests and eating their hearts, which is very painful for the cats. And he makes um, Nakata watch while he does this. And Nakata is very uncomfortable, and he's and he's begging and saying, "Please don't do this, don't do this." And then he starts pulling out cats that Nakata knows. Uh, and when he gets to Mimi. Uh, Nakata finally, this is, Mimi is the nice calico that, uh, that he was talking to earlier, uh, that warned him about this guy. Um, Nakata finally has had enough and stands up in a rage and stabs Johnny Walker to death. And I think he walks back and slips on the blood and hits his shoulder. And he starts to collect the cats and he suddenly wakes up in the field right he's in the field and this is something that's going to happen a lot in this book and that is that we're going to question the reality of whether something actually occurs or not um was this all in his brain um and this book is constantly interested in metaphor right 
do we do things actually or do we do things that metaphorically connect to those things and we'll get into this when we talk about the uh the oedipal curse so and this is part of the oedipal curse and we'll get to that in just a minute so a lot of people have stated that this scene is violent and with no purpose um and they're angry and i get it because this scene is violent and it's hard to read especially if you're a cat lover and i am a cat lover but this had to be believable and what i mean by that is johnny walker absolutely needed nakata to kill him how do you take a human any human and piss them off enough to make them kill you humans don't really want to kill other people most of the time Um, so it had to, this scene gives you the same rage that, that Nakata is feeling. And by the time we've gone through a couple of cats, uh, we're just as ready to kill him as Nakata is. And, and I feel like that's the purpose of the scene being in here. You have to believe that somebody kind and gentle like Nakata would kill another human being. And this is why. It's also important to state that Johnny Walker explains to Nakata that he is building a flute out of cat souls. And he says, I don't really have any emotions. I'm not an emotional being. I just have to build this flute. And this is how you do it. Also, cat hearts taste good. Um, But this is how you build this flute. And I need to build the cat flute in order to build up to uh, being able to build better flutes. And a lot of people have complained that while that is weird and mysterious, uh, it's never explained. And again, I disagree with this. We are going to be talking about this bad guy and his entire arc through this novel as we go, because I do believe he has a complete arc and I do believe it returns to him and I do believe he's important. But let me finish the narrative really quick before we get too far into it. So, um, when Nakata wakes up, uh, well, when he had stabbed Johnny Walker, he got blood on his shirt and on his hands. When he wakes up, he's completely clean. There's no blood. Again, making us question whether or not this murder actually happened. Um, So he goes and he returns Goma to the family and they're very happy and they pay him. And as he's going home... He stops at a police box and he walks in and he tells the officer on duty there, I just stabbed a, a man. And the, the, the cop looks at him like, what the heck? And he sees that he's very clean and no blood or anything like that on him. And then Nakata tells him that tomorrow it will rain, I think it's mackerel, uh, it'll rain fish out of the sky. So the, the police officer's like, okay, this is some senile old man. Um, and he just sends him on his way. He doesn't take his name or anything, uh, which later the cop really regrets, uh, because the next day it does rain mackerel from the sky. Uh, and this is the first kind of miracle we could call it that we see Nakata know about before it occurs. And the cop is shocked, but he thinks, oh man, uh, if, This guy knew the fish were going to rain from the sky. And sure enough, later, there's a man found in his home stabbed to to death. So uh, I'm going to now give away everything about the murder, even though this happens a little later in the book. Uh, Now that the narratives, now that we've gone over those two narratives, we can talk about this. Um, The person that Nakata murdered is Kafka's father. And Kafka's father was a sculptor, a very famous sculptor. And of course, we are led to believe that somehow Nakata and Kafka traded places so that it was actually Kafka doing the killing. Uh, And this is where we get into the concept of metaphorically completing uh, a, a prophecy instead of actually completing. Kafka could not have 
done the murder of his father because he was in Shikoku when the, the murder occurred. And there's no way he could have gotten back to Tokyo in time to kill his dad and then come back. So there's no way Kafka committed this murder. But um, when Nakata stabbed Johnny Walker, he hurt his shoulder. He got blood all over his shirt and his hands. Uh, and somehow... When he woke up in the field, his shoulder was fine and all the blood was gone. And when Kafka woke up, he had blood on his shirt and his shoulder hurt. So somehow they did change places. And this is the fulfillment of the first part of the Oedipal Curse. Uh, Now Kafka's dad is dead. Here's where things get real strange. Was... Kafka's dad, Johnny Walker, or did this being, Johnny Walker, somehow make Nakata think he was talking to Johnny Walker when really he was just breaking into Kafka's dad's house? We never get to know this. We never get to know this. Now, the only hint that I can look back on is when Sakura says that... It sounds like your dad's an alien that just came down to Earth to give birth to a kid. This goes with the alien interpretation. And I'll tell you, when I was a a younger man and read this in 2005, I 100% believed that Johnny Walker was an alien from the spaceship. And it makes sense. It's a way to explain the magical realism going on. And I know that more academic... No, that's not even true. With a, with a a very strong, deep reading of the text, the alien narrative seems to get farther and farther back um, to the point that it doesn't really make much sense. However, Murakami put it in there for a reason. There's even a part where Oshima is talking about metaphor and Greek um tragedies and how we we act out the greek tragedies through metaphor in the real world instead of in reality um and he says it's almost like a plot from a science fiction novel and there's these weird meta lines every once in a while that connect to aliens that make me feel like this is something that murakami was really trying to talk about in this novel so uh i'll leave it up to you in the end what how you want to interpret Johnny Walker, but we've met Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker is the bad guy in this story. Uh, And he does have an arc. And the way that I would consider this is, is that Murakami, if we consider it like a superhero movie, right? In a superhero movie, you'll cut back and forth to see what the bad guys are doing and what the good guys are doing. Um, What the bad guys are doing to make their plan work and what the good guys are doing to foil their plan. If in this book, Murakami never shows us what the bad guys' plans are or what they're doing or even who they are, Right? Johnny Walker appears. He's making a flute out of cat souls, whatever the hell that means. And he needs Nakata to kill him for his plan to work. We have no idea what's going on. None. The bad guys are just doing bad guy stuff. Uh, And there might only be one bad guy. So I should say the bad guy is doing bad guy stuff. Uh, And we are never privy to any of that. We get little hints throughout, but we're never privy to it. And I think that's why a lot of people find this scene so hard to take is because they can't understand why they have to go through the pain of reading about this torture of cats for the bad guy to just instantly die. What was the point? Um, And then uh, again, a lot of people say, and then we never come back to it. And that is not true. We absolutely do come back to it. It is interesting that Kafka wakes up in a Shinto shrine. uh, And I think it's a very specific shrine. And we'll get to that when we talk about this shrine in the future. Okay, that is the murder. And that's everything that happens around the murder. So we can move on to the next part now. Part four, which is Miss Psyche. (laughs) 
So I'm going to quickly give the backstory of Miss Psyche. She is, of course, the woman that runs the library that Kafka is going to be working at now. Um, and this is all told to Kafka by Oshima as they're driving back to the library. So Miss Psyche was in love when she was 15 with the heir to the library, the son of the person that owns the library. And Oshima explains that they were actually soulmates. Earlier, he brought up Plato's Symposium and that, that we all used to be two people and they were split and we spent all of our lives looking for that other half of ourselves. Well, very rarely do people actually find that other half of themselves. And Miss Saiki and the heir to the library were soulmates. Um, this whole next part of the novel in my opinion is the weakest part it's also where all these uh scary sex scenes come from that, that we're going to talk about but i can't help it even even as i get older and jaded uh, i'm kind of a romantic at heart so i connect to this love story and i find it beautiful but the only way that any of this novel will work is that you have to accept this slightly crazy premise um that that these this love is beyond normal love this is this is a a love that defies time and space so as they got older they had many years of, of being in love with each other. As they got older, he decided he wanted to go to college. And she didn't really like this idea. She didn't like him being away from her. Uh, and it kind of throws her into this depression. And she writes a song while he's away. And it happens to be... She records it. And it happens to be heard by somebody important. And eventually it becomes a very famous song. She's like a one-hit wonder from the past. So yeah, she becomes this, this singing sensation with this one song. And the name of the song is Kafka on the Shore, which is, of course, the name of the book as well. Um, and she named the song after a painting that a famous artist came and painted the heir of the library just sitting on the the shore of the ocean looking out uh, at the at the water uh, and he the famous painter titled it Kafka on the shore uh, which is an incredible coincidence that uh, Kafka decided to call himself Kafka but of course in in Japanese culture uh, the concept of coincidence uh, usually has an underlying meaning that is the opposite of coincidence, right? This is this is a true connection. Before she writes the song and before he leaves for college, uh, Miss Psyche has a realization that this is probably the happiest she'll ever be. Those those years they spent from fifteen on, being in love with each other. Um, so she begins to search for another world where she can stay in that happiness forever. And that becomes important later. And that's not something that Oshima tells Kafka. That's something that uh, Miss Saiki tells him later. So she's written this song. She's making money from it, waiting for the heir of the library to come back. Uh, and unfortunately, he's killed in the student riots. And he is going to deliver a message to one faction and he just unfortunately happened to look like the leader of the other faction and they beat him to death. It's terrible. Uh, and luckily, they Murakami didn't choose to show this scene in great detail. We just find this out in passing. But it's absolutely devastating to Miss Psyche. And she goes in herself and she can't get over this. And again, we have to remember that this is the love of soulmates, right? My uh, my used to be gothic romantic heart loves this. Eventually, she disappears. Nobody knows where she goes. Um, and then 
in her late 40s, she suddenly comes back to town. Nobody knows what she's been up to, and she becomes the head of the library. So, Kafka and Oshima return. Kafka starts working at the library. He's given the spare room in the library, which uh, used to be the room of the heir to the library. And the painting, Kafka on the Shore, is hanging in that room. And he looks at the painting a lot. We get a scene here that has caused uh, a lot of trouble, uh, and I kind of get why. So two women come into the library, and they are feminists, and they're checking the library to see if it is full of sexist violations. And these aren't really characters, which makes them really stick out in this book. Because Murakami writes characters very well. Uh, it's, I mean, one of his strongest suits is how well his characters are. And these feel like caricatures. They're, they're foils for him to kind of, for Oshima really, to express certain concepts. And at this point, Kafka doesn't know that Oshima is trans. Um, this is how he learns that. Um, so these bad feminists come in and are nitpicking, uh, says Oshima, nitpicking, um, what's going, what's, what's kind of sexist violations there are in the library. And Oshima uh, easily schools them and they finally end with, you can't understand anything because you're, you're a man. And he pulls out his license and shows that he was he is born and on his license is shown as a woman and they eventually run off later oshima talks with kafka and says i have absolutely no problem with feminism or any other ideologies that people choose to believe in the problem that i have is when people believe in it without understanding it and that that makes sense to me i like that he doesn't like the idea of people following concepts blindly. And I would love to, when I read this, um, my now ex-wife, who's Japanese, read it at the same time as I did. And I remember we talked about this and I can't remember specifically what she said. So it's probably not something I should bring up, but I would, it's, I it's, it would be interesting to have people that are Japanese uh, discuss this particular section of the book because I wonder if it makes more sense in Japanese. I don't know. Uh, all I do know is Oshima likes, in the end, talks about the fact that he likes people that are able to make well-informed decisions instead of following falling into ideas just because they need to belong somewhere. Uh, and that's kind of the whole point of it. Uh, I don't want to defend or not defend it uh, in either way. It's really, I'm just reading the book and um, interpreting why I think Murakami put it in there. So st Kafka starts seeing the ghost of Miss Saeki at 15 in his room late at night. She appears at the desk with her uh, um, head in her hands, looking at the painting Kafka on the Shore. And this is a, a kind of a haunting part, but it's not a scary haunting. Uh, Kafka is super taken with Miss Saiki as, as, as a young woman and begins to fall in love with her. He can't help suddenly just these uh, massive emotional feelings he feels to her. And at times he feels like uh, he can almost get her attention. He, he becomes kind of obsessed with staying up and trying to see Miss Saiki. Um, he asks Oshima to get him a copy of the single of Kafka on the Shore, which uh, Oshima does. And he goes and he listens to it and it's absolutely beautiful. And... He's particularly interested in these two weird chords. 
that are in the bridge of the song that don't make any sense, but he feels like those two chords are the heart of the entire song and that it would just kind of be pop nonsense without them. He's also really interested in how strange and abstract the lyrics are and is confused as to how this song became so popular. But he also understands because he can feel kind of the beauty of it in his soul. And the lyrics seem to be discussing exactly what's going on with Kafka in some parts. Uh, and as we read, we'll see that the other parts are what's going on with Nakata. This song is about both of, uh, of their movements. He also stares at the painting a lot. He, he sits in the desk and tries to stare at it from her same position, the ghost's same position. Uh, and he notices that one of the clouds look like a sphinx. And of he then, of course, thinks about the Sphinx asking Oedipus uh, riddles and the fact that he, he solves the riddle and that's what allows him to marry his mother. And, of course, as Kafka is falling in love with Miss Saiki, he still believes that she is his mother. This is the real curse of Kafka, that he is completely sexually confused um, and connects every woman to him as a relative in some way. So Kafka brings Miss Saiki coffee every day and they talk, but she just kind of stays up in the upper floor of the library writing something. She has a, a fountain pen she loves and she's just always writing. And they speak for a few minutes every time he brings her coffee and they start talking at one point and she says when she was 15 she realized she was the happiest she'd ever be and she looked for a world where she could exist in that 15 year old happiness forever and Kafka believes that she might have found that world and is somehow staying there and that's why he's seeing her ghost she also tells him that one of the things that she did as she was traveling around in those years that she disappeared is she wrote a book about people being struck by lightning uh, and that nobody really cared about it and it disappeared. And he, of course, well, not of course, he realizes that his father at one point was struck by lightning and comes up with a scenario in his brain that uh, they met that he that his father and Miss Saiki met uh, while he while she was interviewing him about being struck by lightning uh, and they had a kid and then she eventually took off this is what he believes occurred after a few days of him being in the library the police show up um, because, of course, his dad's murder has become national news because he was a famous artist. Uh, and the police show up because they're looking for Kafka. Now, Oshima and Kafka have talked about this. And Oshima's like, you really don't have anything to worry about because there's no way you could get from Tokyo to, I mean, from Shikoku to Tokyo to kill your dad. Um, it's impossible. Um, but they are looking for him because they want to ask him questions. They want to see what's going on. And, of course, when they find him, they'll force him to go back to Tokyo and force him to go back to school, and he doesn't want to do any of that. So he uh, is avoiding them, and Oshima lies and says that he hasn't seen him, but Kafka decides that he's going to have to kind of lay low uh, so that the police don't see him. They might be staking out the library. Uh, the reason they were able to trace him here is because when he used his dad's cell phone to call Sakura, they knew that he was in Shikoku. And then they came and they asked at all the hotels and found the hotel he initially stayed at. And he had talked to them about the library. And anyway, they found him. So he's still talking to Miss Saiki. And he asks her, well, there's this really interesting moment where he walks into her office and she's looking at these birds on a wire and there's wind going. Um, and she says... Do you know how birds deal with the wind? And he says, no. And she says, uh, they move their heads. They are constantly moving their heads so that the world doesn't shake around all the time. 
if you've ever hold a, held a chicken, if you grab a chicken and you do this with the chicken, the chicken's head will stay in one place while you move their body around. Not even kidding. Uh, if you have any spare chickens, check it out. And she explains that she's living in memories of the past and that the real world is like the wind to her. Um, and Kafka changes the subject and says, do you have any children? Uh, and she chooses not to answer. Um, and I don't know exactly when this happens in their conversations with each other, but eventually he presents his thesis to her that she is his mother. She met his dad when she was going around uh, writing about lightning, that she had him and eventually abandoned him. And this is also where, where Kafka comes up with the only, the only reason we have throughout this whole book as to why his father would constantly spout this prophecy. Um, Kafka comes up with the idea that his father was incredibly in love with Miss Psyche and that he couldn't have her. So when she left, he poisoned his son basically to go find her and take revenge by making her sleep with her son. That's what Kafka comes up with. Um, now, again, there's so many questions around Kafka's dad, right? Was Johnny Walker just impersonating him? Was Johnny Walker possessing him? Uh, we don't know. Is, is, is Sakura right that Kafka's dad just is an alien that came to Earth to have a baby? Uh, we don't know. We have no idea. But that is Kafka's thesis. And Miss Psyche responds with, well, that's all your ideas. It has nothing to do with me. And he says, well, did you have children? And she chooses not to answer. Her response is, um, it's very windy today, right? And she had talked about the birds with the wind. They have to focus all their attention on keeping their head in one place. Uh, I really liked the way that was said. It is interesting to me that she doesn't really take anything that he says very seriously. She just kind of wipes it away uh, because it has, in her brain, nothing to do with her. That night, Miss Psyche comes to his room and they make love. But he is... He believes that she's sleepwalking because she doesn't seem to be all there. Uh, and this is one of the scenes that people have a huge problem with. Um, is that he is taking advantage of her while she's asleep. Uh, however, I think Murakami's hinting at something different here, and I'm going to get to it in just a second. Uh, because after they're done making love or having sex or him raping her, however you want to look at it, uh, she he, he listens for her car to leave in the night, and he never hears her car leave in the night. She doesn't live in the library. So if she were to be there, she would have to drive from her house. So we're talking about sleepwalking, sleep driving, sleep coming into the library, um, at which point he would take advantage of her. And then she'd have to sleep, walk back. Uh, and he stays up and does not hear her car. Uh, and the next morning he hears her car pull up, which is really hinting at the fact that she wasn't physically there. Now, uh, we're going to have to jump into some other stuff here to get get at what I think Murakami was, was trying to look at. And that is the concept of Ikidyo. Sorry for my bad pronunciation on that. Um, and what Ikidyo is, is the concept of a haunting by a ghost of a person that is still alive. And this is very much, this is huge in Japan. Uh, all throughout history, uh, the Japanese have associated this concept particularly with women and particularly with the concept of women feeling strong emotions and not knowing how to deal with them. This is sexist, but we're talking about uh, way, 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 way back in the past. And Japan has an interesting connection to women that we could, I could do a whole video on that connects to the possibility of 
an early matriarchal society, as China talked about when visiting uh, Japan way, way back. Um, and this concept that women are able to move very easily between worlds. And you see many Japanese mediums are women. Um, the power of spirituality in Japan is very much connected to women. Uh, and so is this living haunting concept, which you could kind of call astral projection, but it's not really that because when this occurs, most times the person that is doing the haunting has no memory or recollection of doing the haunting. So we're going to have to talk about a couple of books uh, to just really quick to, to bring us up to speed with this. And the first is The Tale of Genji. I've got two copies of this book here. It's one of the earliest novels uh, known to the, the world. Uh, it's a very interesting story around the publication of it. Uh, I wouldn't really call it publication. It's written by a woman named Murasaki Shikibu, and it was written in the 10th century, uh, which what, which is called the Heian period in Japanese uh, history. And at that time, the only written language ja uh, Jap Japan had was kanji from China. They took Chinese characters and connected their own spoken language to those characters. And unfortunately, they felt that being able to write was something that only should really be understood and done by men. So women were not allowed to write. And Murasaki Shikibu very much wanted to write. Uh, so the law was that they could not write in kanji using Chinese characters. So she very brilliantly created a syllabic alphabet uh, she made a symbol for each sound in the Japanese language uh, and wrote the tale of Genji in this made-up alphabet, which eventually, um, I think, was used mainly in katakana. Correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, um, yeah, she invented a writing system so that she could write this novel. It's the story of a prince that is born so beautiful that nobody believes he can live long. And it's kind of his relationships around court. And the wonderful thing about it is it gives us a view of 10th century Japan that is just incredible. But the reason I bring this all up is for the Lady Rokujo, who is one of the most interesting characters in the tale of Genji. She is one of Genji's lovers, and she is incredible, incredibly jealous of Genji's wife, the Lady Aoi, and they're, they're named after colors or streets. So she becomes an Ikidyo, Ikidyo, sorry about my pronunciation of that word. And she haunts Aoi until eventually uh, she kills her. And the darkness of this, once she learns that she did it, because she doesn't remember any of this haunting, once she learns that she did it, is, is very sad. And she eventually... Oh, I don't remember what happens specifically to the Lady Rokujo, sorry. Uh, in, a, in a future video, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that more. Uh, but now I have to stick with Murakami. But before I do, I just want to quickly mention... Masks by Fumiko Enchi. This is an incredible novel. Short, one we'll probably uh, do on this channel eventually. Um, and it is uh, about No Theater, N O A H, N O H Theater. And I think that's true. Uh, but it's also about the repression of feminine emotions and the expression uh, how how those are how modern women use different ways to express themselves and it's about an obsession with the lady rokujo from the tale of genji it's been a long time since i've read this if any of that's wrong i apologize but i will be reading this for the channel sometime it's an incredible book so i believe that miss saiki oh uh, it is important to note that oshima and kafka discuss the tale of Genji, Lady Rokujo, and this type of haunting specifically 
in relation to these incidents. So I think that Murakami's pointing real, real strong at the concept that Miss Saeki is not truly there in body. She is haunting um, Kafka. And I think the question is, is she haunting, does she come to that room for Kafka? Or does she come to that room because it's a room that she remembers uh, as a very important place to her because of the air of the company? Um, so she is not sleepwalking. She's sleep haunting. Uh, so he is not actually having sex with her. Uh, his body is having sex with her spiritual body. Um, doesn't have to change anything. If this scene still pisses you off, that's fine. Um, and, and it is a, a really difficult scene, and that makes sense to me. I don't want to defend the act. I just want to talk about this piece of literature and why I think Haruki Murakami put it in there, my interpretation of that. Powerful emotions make people become ikidios. And I wonder if she has come for love. Uh, and then again, I, I instantly get to the question of for Kafka or for uh, the heir of the heir of the library, uh, which in the end, major spoiler, but all these are spoilers. Um, Kafka and him are kind of the same person. Weird. I know. We'll get there. So that's one of the scenes that people have real trouble with, and I understand it. Um, it is interesting to me again. And of course, Miss Psyche has no recollection of this. Uh, and the next next night, she comes again for real, and they uh, they make love um, for for her the first time, for Kafka the second time. And a lot of people, of course, talk about he's taking advantage of her in her sleep. Um, and the book does point to that. So there straight up is textual evidence of what they're talking about. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, correct interpretation of the scene. Um, or it's a spiritual haunting. Um, that's the crazy part about Murakami is he puts all these layers. Uh, and it's the same with the violence, right? Right after the violence... Nakata wakes up in the field, um, and I feel like this book does this over and over again, uh, where he puts forth a scene that is really disturbing and really hard to take, and then um, he does it in such a way that it's almost a take back afterwards, like there's this unique set of circumstances that make that slightly different than what it really is. Um, I feel like that occurs a lot. And of course, the book is about tragedy expressed through metaphor. Did I skip a part? Eventually, I, I might have already said this, but if I, if I skipped it, I want to make sure to say it. Uh, Oshima and Kafka have a conversation about the tragedy of Oedipus. And Oshima says, it's just a metaphor for us rebelling against our parents and everything that they expect us to be, that concept of fate and destiny. Um, and of course, that's the whole theme of this book, is the concept of tragedy expressed through metaphor. And I think that's why Murakami is constantly talking about these incredibly tragic things and putting them into circumstances that make them not completely real. Another example is, does Kafka kill his father? Well, by the physics of the book, he traded places with Nakata and does kill his father. But by the concept of real life, no, he doesn't. Nakata kills his father, right? Um, is, is Kafka held by fate to do all these things, or um, is he expressing them through metaphor? Uh, of course, that all changes because the next uh, day he talks to uh, Miss Psyche in her office and says, I love you, uh, you right here, I love you. Um, and later that night she shows up and they do make love physically. Um, and I'm surprised because a lot of people 
bring up two scenes. The scene with his sister in a dream, which comes later, and the scene of Miss Saiki sleep haunting or sleepwalking. Um, as the most problematic scenes in this book. But, of course, there's a huge age difference. 15 to 50. That's the age difference between Miss Psyche and, uh, and Kafka. Uh, and I don't see a lot of people talking about that. And that's interesting to me. Um, sure, Kafka is precocious, but I think that there's trouble in this. And I think Murakami even points it out, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but this is part of the tragedy, is what's happening to Kafka. Um in this relationship that is incredibly problematic. Anyway, with that, the second part of the prophecy is fulfilled. All that's left is that Kafka uh, needs to sleep with his sister for his the prophecy that his father put on him to be completed. Completed. Miss Psyche keeps coming and take and meeting Kafka at night, day after day after day. Um, Kafka is continuously talking about. Uh, the head of his member and how sensitive it is and I think that the reason that this is in there it's very weird and the reason it's in there is of course this is the first time that he's really done these things so all sensations are new to him and he's learning about it still very weird Murakami sex stuff it's there finally Oshima um grabs Kafka and takes him away from the library. And there's two reasons that he says he does. Number one, uh, the cops are getting close. Uh, and not only that, they have linked Nakata to the crime of killing Kafka's dad. And they think somehow that maybe Nakata and Kafka were... were know each other and we're in this crime together somehow so the cops are getting a little bit more serious he also explains that miss psyche is dying that that's why she came back to the library was just to die um and he feels like he describes it as there's like a train coming and eventually he says that he feels like kafka is kind of that train but also and this goes unsaid, and maybe this wasn't even intended by Murakami. Maybe I'm just putting this in here. I think Oshima wants to get Kafka away from all this weird crap going on. Uh, I think Oshima understands that the relationship he's in with Miss Psyche isn't 100% healthy for anybody. Um, so he's getting Kafka out of that situation. Uh, and it's, an, it's one of these parts that I really really loved Oshima. He's such a good character in this book. But anyway, he takes Kafka, takes him back to the ca uh, cabin, gets him the hell out of there, away from all that stuff. Um, so Kafka is back at the cabin. Um, and when Oshima drops him off, he tells him, hey, I just want to remind you, like, don't go out into the woods there's supernatural stuff out there. In fact, and he tells him the story that, I, I don't know if it was World War I or World War II. I think it's World War II. It's got to be World War II. Uh, that, that there was soldiers that came out to these woods to run drills. And two of the soldiers just disappeared and were never found again. So he says, don't go into the woods. So he's alone in the cabin. Uh, he is devastated about leaving Miss Psyche. He misses her. He's confused um, about his feelings, about his sexuality towards her. He's trying to figure all of this out. And he falls asleep and he has a dream that he goes to Miss Sakura's house. Um, and one can question if this is uh, a similar situation to Miss Psyche coming to him in this sleep haunting. Now, usually the Japanese reserve this concept for women. Men don't really do this in Japanese literature and Japanese belief. Um, so I have a tendency not to think so. Plus there's a part at the end that we'll talk about. But anyway, he has this dream. And in his dream, he rapes Sakura, his sister. Uh, and she expressly says this. Hey, just so you know, as you move forward, you're raping me. 
um, and this can destroy our relationship forever, and he does it anyway. Uh, and this is the part that people have the most trouble with out of this whole book, and it makes complete sense. It's a very scary scene. But again, Murakami puts it under a layer of, this isn't really happening. This is Kafka in a dream. So I'm not going to defend at all anything that happened there, because there's no defense for that. It's awful. Uh, but I am going to discuss why I think Murakami put it in the book why it was in the book. Um, after he does this deed, he feels something evil inside of him cracking out of its shell. Something evil is born. And we talked about Kafka's name and how it means good uh, on one part and bad on the other. Um, good possibility and bad or unacceptable on the other. Uh, and how he is young and is having to choose which path he's going to follow in life. Uh, and I think this represents a choice of him going down a very, very bad path. And later when he and Crow talk about it, when they're traveling through the forest, which we'll get to in just a minute, Crow says, you should never have done that. That was absolutely terrible. Uh, and Kafka said, I'm tired of sitting around and accidentally falling into all of these parts of the prophecy. He said, I wanted to take the prophecy by the horns and choose on my terms instead of the prophecy tricking me into doing it. No excuse whatsoever for what he did. But that is his reasoning. And I, I, I feel like Murakami wanted us to see him choosing the bad before he, he finishes his arc. Um, and at this point, it could be that you can't follow the rest of his arc because it's impossible to after that moment. And I got into a, a big conversation with my buddy about dreams um, and what kind of guilt can be associated with dreams. Uh, and we talked about uh, there's a new movie out where everybody's dreaming about Nicolas Cage. Uh, and it starts out that everybody's dreaming nice dreams about Nicolas Cage, but then he starts murdering and killing people and raping people in their dreams. Uh, and, and the world starts demanding an apology from him. And the whole movie is kind of about the absurdism of blaming somebody for what happens in dreams. Uh, so this is an incredibly complex question because Murakami's allowed Kafka to make a really disgusting, terrible choice to show the the path that that could start leading down uh, in order to make the arc, but he didn't make it real. So it's, it's a incredibly complicated. Um, that's the most I feel like I can say about it. Again, I don't want to defend it at all, um, except in the sense that I think Murakami made an artistic choice to put it in there for a reason. Um, whereas a lot of people say there's absolutely no reason for this scene to be in there, and that I disagree with, but I'm not defending Kafka or his choice in any way. If we need to talk about this more in the comments, feel free. Oh, and I wanted to come back to this, and I'm glad that I wrote this note early on when I was talking about it. Um, earlier, way earlier, the first time he was at the cabin, um, Kafka was thinking about the concept of the responsibility of dreams. And I think that that's interesting here, that even Murakami, while he's saying this didn't really happen, is holding Kafka accountable for the decision that he made in the dream, just like Crow is. And I like that. Murakami invites people to be disgusted with Kafka uh, during while he makes this choice. So the next day, he of course starts going out into the forest and this time he's come prepared. He has spray paint and a compass and all this other stuff and he is ready to go into this forest and not get lost. Okay, we've lost camera so I'm gonna finish up this last little bit uh, and then I'll have to record again tomorrow. This is one heck of a deep reading. So this will be in parts. So he goes into the forest and eventually he gets far enough that the, the 
forest kind of starts getting into him and the supernaturalness of the forest starts taking over. Sorry about that. I think we're still recording. Yeah. And he decides, forget it. He doesn't care if he gets lost in this forest. It's what he wants to do. So he throws away his compass. He throws away his spray paint and just goes, lets himself get, get lost. And eventually he comes upon an area and meets the two soldiers that were lost in World War II. And they're, they're a little bit older than him. Uh, not a lot. So they haven't aged. And they guide him to the other world. Um, and this only works because the other world is open. Uh, and the other world is only open because of Nakata. Um, so the next part, we're going to go and look at how Nakata opens this world to people again. And that'll be part five, Nakata and Hoshino. to Nakata's side of the story and he's been busy while all this is going down uh, he left Tokyo when we last saw him uh, and it rained mackerel the next day so he's heading west and he gets all the way with some help of a couple of nice office ladies and a uh, man that's driving in the same direction he is he gets uh, all the way to a rest stop off the highway and he's looking for a trucker that will take him west. He knows that he has to go over a big bridge. Uh, and eventually, as he's walking around this truck stop rest area, uh, he sees a bunch of bikers beating up another biker. And he goes over there and tries to stop them. And they won't stop, so he just gets angry and picks up his umbrella and opens his umbrella and it begins to rain leeches which absolutely stops them from beating up on this guy anymore and they all run off and he meets after this he meets a guy named Hoshino who becomes a very important character in this book and another uh, one of my personal favorites I really enjoyed the Nakata side of this much more than the Kafka side this time around as I read it. So Hoshino takes a liking to Nakata because he says Nakata looks like his grandpa. And he feels like he owes uh, some things to his grandpa, so he decides to help Nakata get west. So they go west, and... As they're driving, they're talking, and Nakata stops and buys... I'm sorry. Uh, Hoshino stops and buy, buys Nakata uh, noodles and is just really kind of taking care of him. And he drops off his truck, and he's, he's supposed to turn around and go right back to Tokyo. But while they've been driving, they've been talking about where Nakata feels like he needs to get to. And he says, I don't know where I'm going but I know I have to go over a big bridge. And again, this is the concept I brought up earlier that Nakata understands things in ways that uh, people around him don't understand. But Hoshino was able to tell that Nakata is talking about the bridge to Shikoku. So he's like, oh, I I'll take you there. And he takes a few days off of work and decides to help Nakata get to Shikoku. So they make it over the bridge and... Hoshino gets a hotel, and Nakata suddenly is like, I'm super tired. And he tells Hoshino, hey, I may sleep a lot, but uh, don't worry, I'm fine. I just need to recharge my batteries, he says. And Nakata goes to sleep and is asleep for 30, 38 hours straight. So Hoshino is just kind of walking around Shikoku, trying to figure out what to do. And he starts thinking about his grandpa and his youth. And we learn that Hoshino was a kind of a rebellious youth. He didn't have an easy line of it from growing up straight to success. And his grandfather, every time that Hoshino would get arrested, his grandfather would be the one to bail him out. 
and his grandfather never gave him any lectures or anything like that. And Hoshino got involved in all of his own tragedies, so much so that he never got to thank his grandfather for all of that before he died. So Hoshino also kind of represents this liminal space in the sense that he is on in between responsibility and irresponsibility. He's still not doing great for himself. He's working as a trucker. His back continuously has issues. And because he has to sit constantly and drive. So he's at this in-between place between trying to grab onto his own life and just kind of irresponsibly rolling through. Eventually, Nakata wakes up and he tells Hoshino that he needs to find an entrance stone. He needs to find a stone that is an entrance. And he doesn't know what the stone looks like. He'll just know it when he sees it. So they go off on this wild uh, goose chase for this entrance stone. And they start by going into a library. And neither of them have been in a library before. Um... And they start looking through books, and uh, uh, Nakata is looking through a book that's just pictures of famous stones, and Hoshino's reading like crazy. Uh, he says he reads more than he has in his whole life, just trying to uh, look for these stones, and he learns a ton about the history of the area that he's in. In between these visits to the local library, uh, Hoshino, or Nakata, comes out, they're in the hotel, and Nakata comes out and says, Hey, is your back in pain? And Hoshino says, My back's always in pain. It's it's part of being a driver. Uh, and Nakata says, Hey, let me fix it. And he's like, Okay, give it a go. So he lays down, and, he, and Nakata says, Yeah, your spine is, is all out of shape. Uh, and he says, I can put it back into shape for you, but just so you know, this is really going to hurt. And Hoshino's like, Psh, It's fine. Pain's not that big of a deal. And Nakata's like, Okay. And he fixes his spine and he's never done this before but for Hoshino the pain is so intense that he nearly passes out and his life flashes before his eyes and Murakami describes this beautiful like beautifully like this is an amount of pain that Hoshino can barely handle and then once it's over and it starts to go away he realizes that his back is indeed fixed he feels like he's literally de-aged. He feels youthful again. Uh, and this, I think we see again, uh, another miracle from Nakata. Uh, and he's never worked on anybody's back before. He just said he could see that it was out of line and knew to fix it. And we're starting to see this power Nakata has of understanding this world in ways that nobody else can understand it. So, they go back to the library and they're looking for the entrance stone. We need to take a moment here and uh, take another segue in order to understand exactly um, what the history of this concept of an entrance stone uh, would mean to a reader that understands Shinto a little better. So, I'm going to bring up two books. The first is the Kojiki. And this is the earliest history ever written of Japan. And then there was, it was basically rewritten and added to in the Nihon Shoki. And this is a copy of that. This is translated by Arthur Whaley. He also did a Genji translation. Not any of the ones that I showed you, though. Um, these are incredible books, especially if you are interested in the mythology of Japan. That's that's what what's really cool about them. Uh, and we are specifically interested in the tale of Izanami and Izanagi, which I believe is huge in this novel. In fact... I would say as much of a retelling as this is of Oedipus, it is also just as much a retelling of the Izanami Izanagi uh, myth. And we'll get into that, of course, at the very last part, because really it's the latter half of this book that deals with this myth so much. I have to remember the genders of these two gods. 
So Izanami is the female goddess and Izanagi is a male goddess um, and they are brother and sister and they give birth to the Japanese islands. Uh, they're basically the first intercourse that occurs and they give birth to the islands of Japan. So they're kind of the gods of creation for Japan. And it's been a while since I've really uh, looked at this myth, so I'm going to have to do kind of a quick version of this. Basically, Izanami dies and goes to the underworld. And you'll see a lot of connections between this and Greek mythology. Uh, she goes to the underworld, which is a cave that leads into the earth. And Izanagi decides to go get her. He misses her and wants to go get her. So he goes down into the underworld and finds Izanami. And Izanami's like, I can't go back with you because I've already had the food down here. I've already eaten the food, which is reminiscent of the pomegranate seeds and Persephone. Um, but he finds a way. I can't remember how he does it. He finds a way. He says, I'm going to take you anyway. Uh, and she says, okay, um, but you, you have to promise me that as we're leaving this place, as we're leaving this world, that you do not look back. And this is a huge uh, trope that happens in a lot of Japanese fairy tales and a lot of uh, myths. There's a bridge uh, in Arashiyama, which is this mountain area of Kyoto, uh, and there's a local belief that as you walk across it, you can't look back. And we, we see it in, in fairy tales and all over the place. But this myth is probably the origin of the don't look back story. Um, in, in Japan, the gods are really disgusted by death and decay. That is the worst kind of pollution um, that, that, the, that affects the gods. They absolutely hate it. So... They are running out and the, I don't, I don't want to say minions of the underworld. Anyway, they're being followed as they're running out of the underworld. And Izanagi throws down different things he has in his hands. And they turn into things that stop the people from chasing them. And he's about to get out with Izanami. And he looks back at Izanami and she is putrid. She is rotted. She is dead. She is full of pollution. And he is so disgusted that he, he lets go of her, runs out of the cave, and takes a large stone and blocks the entrance to the, the other world, the land of the dead. Uh, and this is the concept of an entrance stone. An entrance stone is a stone that protects a passage to another world, a very liminal object. So if you ever see stones in Japan that have ropes and paper, folded paper hanging off of them that look kind of like this, don't mess with them. They're, uh, they're, they're put there for a reason. They're a, part of, they're a part of a religious ceremony through Shintoism. And we're just rubbing the surface. Just discussing Shinto in itself as a religion is difficult. But anyway, that's instantly what comes to mind when somebody says entrance stone in this book. We're, we're suddenly thinking about a stone blocking a passage to another world, probably the underworld or the world of the dead. Which makes this latter half of the book, Hoshino and Nakata's journey, really interesting. However, I think a lot of non-Japanese readers read this, don't know the implications of an entrance stone, so they're like, he's looking for a rock? Doesn't make any sense. And feel like this part of the novel really drags. And there is a lot of complaints about the Nakata and Hoshino story uh, really dragging at the end of this, of this novel, which I think it's actually very interesting because this is when Shinto comes up and the concept of Izanami and Izanagi. Uh, and I think the first part of that, them being brother and sister, starts with his dream um, of the rape of Sakura. So we're already starting to see this Izanami, Izanagi myth play out, and it only goes deeper and deeper. Um, every night when Nakata goes to sleep, Hoshino just goes walking around the area, and 
They're really stumped about the, the library. They're having a very hard time. And he's just walking around the streets of this town. I think the town's called Takamatsu. I can't remember. He's walking around the streets of this town. And suddenly somebody's calling to him. And he turns around and it's Colonel Sanders. And Colonel Sanders helps him. And as Hoshino talks to him, at first he thinks he's just a pimp. Because Colonel Sanders is like, hey, would you like a girl for the night? Um, and he's like, oh, you dressed up like Colonel Sanders to bring in customers as a pimp. And, he's, and Colonel Sanders is like, no, I, I'm a concept. I'm an idea. I'm a concept. I'm not actually Colonel Sanders. I'm a concept and an idea. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you. And either I don't get this or Murakami might have made a mistake. So this is the second capitalist mascot icon that we've seen in this story. So the first time I read it, my knee-jerk reaction was to think that this was another form of Johnny Walker, which it isn't. We, we find where Johnny Walker's gone later in the book. So, for some odd reason... Murakami made a bad guy that is a capitalist mas mascot icon. And then he made an ally to the good guys that is also a capitalist uh, mascot icon. And you could probably write an entire paper on just the fact that he chose these two mascots. Um... But if they are two different things entirely, I feel like it would have been better if he somehow differentiated between the two. Or maybe this is how gods and helpers, and he says, Colonel Sanders says over and over again, I'm not a god, I'm not a Buddha, I'm, an, I'm a concept. Maybe this is how these things are able to present themselves, the only way they're able to present themselves. Maybe this is another alien, if you want to get go into that reading. Uh, but that's one that wants to help instead of hinder. Who knows? Again, I feel like there is a massive story going on behind the scenes that deals with Johnny Walker, Colonel Sanders, whether they're aliens or gods or concepts. Um... And that Nakata and Hoshino and Kafka and Miss Saeki and Oshima are all pawns in this game. And the real story is what these people are doing. Colonel Sanders and Johnny Walker. Um, but we're not given that story. We're given the story of the pawns. Um, and for me, that's not a negative. I find that really interesting, right? Let's create a whole save the world style um, the gods are involved epic storyline and then tell the story of the pawns that only know little pieces of the story. I think it's kind of a great idea. Um, but again, I don't know why he made them both. Maybe that's how they have to present themselves. Maybe it's the only way, way they know how, and that would make sense. But anyway, Colonel Sanders is an ally and not, uh, Johnny Walker, the bad guy, or another bad guy. Um, so the whole time I was expecting him to do something really evil, and he doesn't. Uh, he ends up taking Hoshino down this back alley. He eventually takes him to a Shinto shrine, which I believe is the same shrine that Kafka wakes up in when somehow he and Nakata trade places when Kafka is uh, killing his dad, when it's actually Nakata. Um... He takes him to the shrine and calls him a girl. And Hoshino goes and makes love with this woman. And it's the best sex he's ever had in his life. And she's a philosophy student and starts talking about philosophy. And 
he really enjoys that and says, keep talking about philosophy. Uh, and she talks about, she talks about Henry Bergson's matter and memory. And she also talks about Hegel. I do not know enough about these philosophers to be able to include them in my deep read, which is too bad because everything thus far has connected to the story, right? We see Genji and the idea of the Ikidyo, sorry for my bad pronunciation, right before Masayaki uh, sleep haunts. And we see um, Oshima talking about the tragedy of Oedipus right before the the actually right after the death of a father, and so on and so forth. Every step in this book uh, has been informed by the literature that they're talking about, which is one of my favorite aspects of this book. But uh, I would have to add a level of study into Hegel and this other person that unfortunately would take me so long that this video would never have come out and I want to make other videos for this channel. So any philosophy majors that are able to look at this specific part of the book and want to add to it would be great. Uh, I just don't have the time to, to learn enough to speak about what exactly it is that Murakami is connecting here. So philosophy majors, help me out. All right. But, from what I understand, she gets him to question even further uh, what he's doing with his life. Um, so he goes back to the shrine, and Colonel Sanders is like, Hey, there is, uh, this entrance stone is right here. I do want to add really quick, I said that I feel like every sex scene in this book um, has a purpose, and... The one I just described seems the most purposeless. Uh, it's also the the least weird of all of them, although he does ask her to talk about philosophy while they do it. But other than to get... I mean, easily Colonel Sanders could have just said those philosophical things to Hoshino to get him to start thinking about what he's doing with his life. Uh, so I, I think I've been beat. There is a sex scene in this story that I don't think really has any use or meaning to furthering the plot. And it's this one. But anyway, uh, Colonel Sanders says, there's the entrance stone. Pick it up. Take it with you to the hotel. Throw it down by your pillow. Go to sleep. Um, so Hoshino picks up this stone and it's heavy. But uh, Colonel Sanders gives him this thing to wrap it in, and he picks it up, and he's able to carry it, and he goes and he gets a cab, and he goes back to the hotel, and he puts it by Nakata's pillow and goes to bed. So Nakata wakes up. There's the entrance stone. He's proud of Hoshino. Uh, that part of their journey is done. Now they just have to figure out how to open it. And Hoshino, or Nakata says there's a ton of bad weather coming. There's going to be a lot of lightning and everything. And sure enough... Uh, the sky clouds up and a lot of lightning starts striking. And Nakata talks to Hoshino and says, I'm afraid. I'm afraid because I'm hollow. And this connects to uh, earlier when they were talking about the void, how he can just sit for hours without a problem because he just goes into the void, the emptiness that's always been in uh, within him. And he says, I'm hollow which means anything can get in here. And that's such a, a terrifying notion, right? He's afraid of being possessed. Anything can take over because he's hollow. And this makes sense when we think about the fact that part of him has been left in the other world, which we'll get to later. So they decide they have to, to open the, the stone, which I really thought Nakata was going to do. But it makes sense to have Hoshino do it because... Hoshino 
suddenly the stone is like a million times heavier. And this indicates that the supernatural is happening. He's going to open this uh, stone. It's more than just a stone right now. Um, and it is so hard to do that he almost kills himself flipping this stone over. So he has to pick it up and flip it over. Uh, and he does it, but like I said, it, it he, he passes out afterwards. It, it really kicks his butt to flip this stone. But when he does, the other world is open. And this is what allows for the journey of Kafka to go into the other world, which is right about where we left off on the last one. Uh, and we'll get back to him eventually. So after this, Nakata goes to sleep again. Uh, and he does another marathon like two days sleep. So Hoshino is just kind of left to his own and he starts walking around town and eventually he makes his way to a coffee shop. And in the coffee shop, uh, they are playing a piece of classical music. And I want to, to tell you exactly what this piece of classical music was because I think it's important. The music that's playing is Beethoven's and it's the Archduke Trio. And Hoshino is thinking about the concept of Nakata. And he's thinking about the fact that he got his back fixed and all these different things and the way that the that Nakata acts. And he keeps saying Nakata is not the Buddha, but he's done these miracles. And he's slowly coming to the realization that he is, in a weird way, kind of like an apostle to Nakata, an, an acolyte, a follower of Nakata, and he really loves the old man. And then he's listening to this music that's playing, the Archduke Trio, and it's a type of music that he would never have been interested in before, but this time it really connects to him, and he, and he falls in love with it, and he starts thinking about his life, and he starts thinking about his job, and he's like, oh my god, they're going to fire me, I'm going to have to beg for my job back, and then uh, eventually he comes to this realization that he's really been wasting his life and that he is going to become a follower of Nakata. He is going to follow this old man uh, and he doesn't give a crap about his job anymore. Uh, he is going to follow Nakata. So the next morning he gets a call from Colonel Sanders and Colonel Sanders is like, yo, the cops are after you. And the cops have linked Nakata to the death of Kafka's father because he walked in and spoke to that, that guy at the police box. Um, and eventually he talks about that. And um, they've traced him here. So they think that there's a connection between him and Kafka. So the police are really looking for him. And Colonel Sanders says, now they're even looking for you. So I've got an apartment for you. You can stay there as long as you like. Get the rock, wake up Nakata, and get out of there. And that's exactly what he does. He wakes up Nakata, they get a cab, and they go to this apartment so that the cops won't find them. So the next couple of days, Hoshino rents a car and he and Nakata drive all over town because Nakata knows that he has to go to a certain place, but he, he can only know it when he sees it. And they are driving all around the town and uh, Hoshino's asking like, hey, if we don't find it in this city, what next? And he says, then we just keep spreading out. Um, and Hoshino's getting really scared that he's going to be driving all day for the next like three seasons as they try to find this random place and then eventually they get lost and find this weird neighborhood that's not on the map and he goes to this area to turn around and Nakata says there's the place that's the place that we need to go and they they coincidentally luck in to finding it now again the Japanese would not consider this coincidental, right? They're led there. All these things are occurring for a reason. So they read the sign and say, okay, there's a tour. We'll come back tomorrow. So the Hoshino and Nakata go the next day. They go to the library. They take the tour. Um, Nakata eventually, after the tour, runs upstairs, even though he's not allowed to, and runs into the office of Miss uh, Saiki and says, I need to talk to you. And she looks at him for a minute and says, I've been waiting for you. And Oshima and Hoshino both leave the office 
and Nakata and uh, Saeki have a talk. So it turns out that both of them are missing half their shadows. Miss Saeki, when she was 15 years old, longed to find a place to live forever as a happy 15-year-old. So she found the entrance stone and was able to open it and left a part of herself in that other world. And Nakata says, yeah, I, I have to deal with the fact that you opened the stone back then. So I've reopened the stone and I have to figure all this out and fix this. And you can tell as you're listening to this that Miss Saeki realizes that, that she's done, that she's going to die uh, right at this moment. And she asks Nakata to burn this manuscript that she's been working on, this thing she's been writing for so long. And it's her entire story. Uh, and she asks him to burn it. And she also brings up Kafka and says, I hate that I got him involved and I hate that I'm going to cause him any pain or confusion. And I feel like this is a moment of her seriously considering the fact that he is much younger than her. And that she has major regret for involving herself with somebody that young. And I'm glad that Murakami put that in there. So, Nakata agrees to burn the manuscript, and he goes back downstairs, he grabs Hoshino, and he goes. A little bit later, Oshima goes up to talk to Miss Sa uh, Sayaki and finds her dead at her desk. She died of a heart attack. So we never know if Nakata killed her, or if just him going there was the other world telling him to be there right before she passed away. Either way, it's the beginning of putting things back together the way that they're supposed to be. So after that, Hoshino and Nakata go to a dry riverbed and burn her manuscript so that nobody can ever read it. Uh, they got rid of the rental car the day before and decided to walk to the library because it was so close, but they get a cab back because after Nakata burns the manuscript... Uh, he's very tired, and so Hoshino grabs a cab, and Nakata falls asleep in his in the cab, and Hoshino carries him in his arms from the cab up the stairs to the apartment, puts him in bed, uh, takes off his shoes, and tucks him in. It's a beautiful moment. Uh, I love these two stories, these these two's story. It's it's really wonderful. The next morning. He goes in to see how Nakata's doing, and Nakata has died. Probably the saddest part of the entire book for me, uh, Nakata dying. And that brings us to the end of this part. And the last part is part six, and that is The Other World. So we left Kafka and he was being led by two soldiers uh, that of course got lost way back in World War II but magically seemed to be here. Of course that is because the entrance stone has been opened by Nakata and Hoshino. So he's able to follow these soldiers. They move very quickly but he doesn't want to seem weak so he keeps up with them and they're very impressed uh, that he keeps uh, up with them and they come... Uh, out of the forest into this valley and at the bottom of the valley is a little town and they take him into this town and they they put him in a house that is an exact replica of the cabin but there's no books inside the cabin and there are clothes inside the cabin but and they all fit him but they seem like they're kind of handmade uh, there's there's really nothing to read around here. And they say, hey, hang out here until you get used to this world. Uh, there'll be somebody by later to cook uh, something for you. And later, somebody does show up. It is Miss Saeki is as the 15-year-old. 
So he is meeting the 15-year-old of Miss Saeki that she left way back when she originally opened the entrance stone. So this 15-year-old version of Miss Saeki has been living in this world for a really long time. And thoughts and memories seem to have no real power here. He's very excited to meet her um, and he speaks with her about the fact that he knows her and that uh, they have a history together and she's just not interested. And she doesn't seem to really have memories or thoughts or care. I'm sorry, I forgot one thing that I want to jump back to really quick. When Miss Saeki is talking to Nakata uh, before she dies, uh, Nakata asks her what memories are. And Miss Saeki says, memories are... Uh, memories warm you up from the inside, but also tear you apart. And I think that that is such a beautiful statement and such a realistic s statement right? The double-edged sword of nostalgia. Really, really beautifully said in that, in that one little quote. And this 15-year-old version of Saeki is the opposite of that. She doesn't have any warmth or anything tearing her apart. She's vapid. And Kafka asks about books, and she says there are no books. And he asks about memories, and she says there's really no memories either. You'll get used to this place. Um, and he said, is there a library? And she said, yeah, there is a library. And of course, it's going to look just like the library, I'm sure, in the, in the world. Um, but she says there's no books there. And eventually she says memories are dealt with in the library. And I just have to say this. This is all Hard Boiled Wonderland and the end of the world. This is the end of the world portion of Hard Boiled Wonderland again. Um, and that doesn't bother me. Uh, when I was in grad school, I had a teacher and I was talking to her about trying to write about this concept that was really hard to get out. And I kept trying and trying through my stories. Um, and she said, we have to allow writers their obsessions. And I thought that was incredible. And I love that concept. And Murakami obviously has uh, some concepts that he is obsessed with. Um, there is, of course, Murakami Bingo. And I think you can get a couple bingos just from this novel off this card. Um, the reason that we can do that is because he is trying his best to express something that is very important to him. And he never see, he never feels that he can express it well enough. In fact, his novel that's going to be coming out in November is just another retelling of the end of the world portion of Hard Boiled Wonderland and the end of the world. He's not done with this idea. He's going to obsess over it. So this, this version, this other world that they make it to in Kafka on the Shore is yet another echo of Hard Boiled Wonderland and the end of the world, the end of the world portion. Then we cut to the boy named Crow, which is a crow in this uh, instance. And I don't know if he's always a crow. He's not described a lot, but he's very much a crow at this part. And he flies off. He says, I have somewhere I have to go. And he flies off to a specific spot. And he sees a man in a red jumpsuit and a black silk hat. And I don't know if Murakami's trying to hint at another capitalist mascot here. I, ca I couldn't figure it out. My buddy and I talked about it. Uh, we can't figure it out. And it's Johnny Walker. And the way that we know it's Johnny Walker is because he has a bag with a bunch of flutes in it. And he says, nobody can hurt me because I've got flutes against cats. I've got flutes against... And he, and he lists all these flutes that he has. And, he's, uh, and he says, I'm here to take advantage of a situation. Right? So all this stuff that Nakata is doing, opening the, the entrance and then reclosing the entrance... Uh, it's all to fix what Miss Saeki did in the past. But this Johnny Walker bad guy knows it's happening and wants to take advantage of it. And he says that he's here to make an even bigger flute that will be the end of the world. Right? Again, what the bad guys are planning, we never know. 
We never know. We just watch them be thwarted by pawns of the good guys. We don't know what the bad guys are doing. Uh, but but this is the flute guy come back. And he is waiting on one side of the entrance. And he says, I had to die to come here. I had to die to get here. So that I can be ready on this side of the entrance when whatever I'm waiting for comes through from the other side. And whatever he's waiting for at this entrance, he needs to make this bigger flute. So that's more of Johnny Walker's arc, and it's not the end of the bad guys. So Crow is like, I'm going to mess you up, and Johnny Walker's like, you can try, but you're just an illusion. You're nothing. And Crow destroys his face, pulls out his eyes, pulls out his tongue, and the whole time Johnny Walker's just laughing because it makes no difference. Um, Crow can't affect Johnny Walker because he is an illusion. He's not a real person. He is an imagination that Kafka created. So Kafka uh, eventually is visited by the actual Miss Saiki, the older Miss Saiki, uh, and they have a conversation. And the only reason, of course, that he's able to see her is because she's died. So she has now come to this underworld. Uh, Johnny Walker calls it Limbo. He calls it Limbo, uh, which is interesting. And I don't know what the original Japanese word was in the text right there, but it's translated as Limbo. And maybe that's the word Murakami used. I don't know. But she sees Kafka. She's happy to see him. And then she says, you need to leave. You need to get out of here. This is, this is not what I want for you. Um, and he says, but I don't want to, I want to spend my time here with you. And she said, well, I don't care. Um, if you can't do it for yourself, then do it for me. Leave this area for me. And that he can do. He loves her and can leave for her. Uh, they do have a conversation and he does ask her some questions. Uh, one of the questions that he asks her is, are you my mom? And again, she says, uh, this is your thesis not mine and they hug each other and they speak as if she is his mom and she says stuff like i'm sorry for abandoning you can you forgive me but it's really strange because if you look at it in context she could be talking about the fact that she's just died and she is sorry for abandoning him in the the real world so I am not 100% convinced that um, Miss Ayaki is Kafka's mom. In fact, I honestly don't think that she is. I think that... And, and eventually she says, you are um, Kafka, but you are my lover. And she says, don't you remember sitting on the beach with me while your portrait is being painted? And suddenly he has a memory uh, of Kafka on the shore, that he is the heir to the library, that he is uh, the other half of Miss Saeki. Um, I don't know if they're if Murakami's dealing with reincarnation here. Probably, that would be my guess, uh, and I think that that's more what he meant. But he definitely has her speak in such a way that uh, could also be interpreted that she is his mother. Absolutely. But I have a tendency to fall uh, to the reading that Oshima gives that we only metaphorically act out the tragedy of Oedipus. Uh, that in the long run, he doesn't kill his father. He doesn't sleep with his mother and he doesn't sleep with his sister because Nakata killed his father, because um, Miss uh, Saeki is not his mother and because Sakura is not his sister. He also asks her where she got the chords for the, the bridge of her song. Uh, and she says that's, how she, that's why she opened the entrance gate, was to get those chords, um, I think. Or the, the, this, this place had something to do with it. It's, it's, it's really interesting. And then she says, you have to go. And before uh, he leaves, she stabs her arm and gives him her blood to drink. Oh, I forgot to say earlier that uh, 
he did eat while he was in the land of the other world underworld which connects again to the izanami and izanagi story from the koji ki which we talked about earlier so we're still seeing that story play out now that the oedipal aspect is done uh, Murakami's really playing into this Izanami and Izanagi myth. So he drinks a few drops of her blood, and that's really weird. Don't know why that happened. Uh, and they leave, and he goes and finds the soldiers, and the soldiers start taking him back out of the underworld. And they tell him, don't look back. Uh, again, the Izanami and Izanagi myth. You cannot look back. You cannot look back. Uh, and he does look back, and he just sees the town, but he freezes in place because he knows Miss Sayaki is down there. And all he wants to do is be with her. And so he's frozen, and he's about to go back, and suddenly the blood that he drank from Miss Sayaki thaws him, and he's able to turn around and keep on going. So that blood saves him. When he gets to the entrance... And they're like, okay, go all the way through the woods the way you came to get back to your cabin. And they're like, and this time, don't turn around, dude. We mean it. And so he doesn't. He runs all the way back to the cabin um, and, uh, and does not look back. The next day, uh, Oshima's brother shows up, who's a surfer. He's half owner of the cabin. He says, you got to come back right now. Something's happened. Oshima's got to talk to you. Uh, so they drive back, and they don't talk much, but Oshima's brother says, hey, I'm a surfer. If you ever want to surf, let me know. Um, and then he asks, did you go into the forest? And Kafka's like, yeah, I went into the forest. Um, and the brother asks, did you see anything? And maybe soldier? Uh, and Kafka says, I saw two soldiers. And they're like realizing they've both been to that place with the soldiers um, I don't know what that means about the uh, opening and closing of the stone. He makes it so hard to open and close, in the, close the stone that I think that he might have made a mistake here in the sense that he shouldn't have allowed so many people in and out if the stone is closed and if opening the stone causes such trouble. Uh, because it seems like, well, maybe... No, I don't know how old this guy is. Yeah, yeah, the, the stone shouldn't be open. Maybe, no, because then he would have to close it. Yeah, I don't, I can't really figure out how he's able to see these soldiers if the stone was closed after Miss Sayaki first opened it. And if she opened it and left it open, then Nakata would have had to have closed it, not open it. So somehow Miss Sayaki opened it and then it was closed. Either she closed it or somebody else did. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he goes back, finds out Miss Sayaki is dead, decides he's going to return to Tokyo, talks to Oshima, who is his best friend and the coolest dang character in this entire story. Um, Oshima says, dude, come back anytime. Uh, because he decides, Kafka decides he's going to go back to Kafka. Uh, he's going to go back to Tokyo and finish school. Um, and Oshima says, when you're done, come back. Work for the library, man. We need you. Um, and it's it's a cool moment. I love that Kafka has decided to start making decisions for himself and doing things that he thinks are right. He calls Sakura. They discuss, hey, she says, hey, I had a dream about you. Um, and he's like, oh, what was it about? And she says, you were lost in a house uh, and you were constantly trying to find your way out of this house. She said it was a real nightmare. So the dream that he had about his sister was not the same dream that she had, which to me shows that he did not spirit haunt her. This was his dream. This was his bad decision in a dream. Terrible, awful crappy uh, horrible decision that he made in a dream that uh, um, that had nothing to do with the real Sakura um, and he calls her sister and uh, they are like family and that's that's I think really incredible so that ends the Kafka Misayaki section of this story. Uh, there's only one last thing we have to talk uh, about, and that's Hoshino, the end of the novel. Uh, Hoshino, after Nakata dies, is 
like, okay, I got to get out of here. I don't want to get caught by the cops. I don't want any trouble. Uh, he turns up the AC super big in Nakata's room so that the body doesn't start to stink. And he packs his stuff, but then he realizes, oh, oh, the entrance stone is still open. I have to close this entrance stone. So he picks it up and it's the normal wait. He's like, this is, I can't, I have to wait for the right time. Um, so he's going stir crazy in this house with the corpse of Nakata uh, and he's rubbing the stone and trying to talk to the stone in the same way that Nakata did. I forgot to bring that up earlier. Nakata talks to the entrance stone. Um, and finally, a couple days in, there's a cat on the patio and he walks out and he's like, how you doing cat? And the cat's like, how are you doing Hoshino? Um, and he's like, oh God, I'm talking to cats now. Um, and the cat's like, you have taken Nakata's place because you have a one, one in a million chance here to, um, stop a really terrible thing from happening by a really terrible human being. Um, and he says, so there's something that is going to try to get in to the other world. And the stone is open right now. And... It's going to try to make its way in. And you can't let it. You can't let it. I don't care what you have to do. Pulverize it. Destroy it. Kill it. You can't let it get in. It is pure evil. It's bad. It's terrible. Do not let it get in. Um, and he says, can I defeat it? And the cat says, if it stops and focuses, you probably can't beat it. But its entire focus is going to be to get in to the other world. So during its travel, you'll probably have a chance to beat it. So he waits, and that evening he starts hearing a terrible sound. And he opens the door where Nakata's corpse is, and there is a large white worm coming out of Nakata's mouth. Uh, and... All it cares about is movement. So Hoshino cuts it, smashes it with a hammer. Uh, he does all this stuff as it's coming out, and there's nothing inside the worm. So anything he does to it doesn't matter. It just reforms. And this is beautifully written by Murakami. Uh, the entirety of this organism's concept was to be unkillable, and able to move into the opening of the other world. So nothing that Hoshino does to it hurts it or stops it. It doesn't even need to defend itself. It is created for the sole purpose of going into the other world. So Hoshino realizes that he has to close the stone. That's the only way to defeat this thing. Uh, so he runs over, and just like last time, the stone is incredible, he incredibly heavy, uh, but eventually he's able to lift it up and flip it. And that closes the other world. And the worm's existence is suddenly pointless, and it tries to hide, and Hoshino d basically annihilates it to the point that it's little white balls of flesh. And he packs them up and all of his other stuff, and he's going to take them out and burn them and then go try to get his job back, which I found interesting. I was kind of wishing that his arc would take him in, on a different career path, but what can you do? This is the, the good guys winning. This is how Johnny Walker is defeated. And I know that it's very difficult to care because Murakami didn't tell us the bad guy's plans we never knew what his story was we never knew what was at stake so it was it was all very weird and some people have said this is just mysteries piled on mysteries piled on mysteries with no answers uh, and i think the answers are there but murakami makes it very hard and i and that's why i understand the frustration of a lot of people with this book he makes it very hard uh for people to solve them it's a lot of work to solve the riddles of this book, which I love, but not everybody does. Um, yeah, so he was waiting at the entrance. He died, and he was waiting at the entrance uh, for this worm to get through because somehow the merging of them would allow him to build a bigger flute and do what he wanted to do, but he couldn't. This is my interpretation. Um, 
take it as you will. The question is, what's the worm and what's Johnny Walker? And that is completely up to you. Is this some kind of evil person? Is it an evil god from the Shinto religion? Is it an alien? Uh, the answer it can be any of those things. Whatever your brain thinks is the coolest is the, the one you should take. And that's uh, what's awesome about Murakami leaving this so open in it is we get to imagine the bad guys as epic as we want to. Uh, I feel like he points to aliens a lot, so that's probably where I'll land. That we have this very traditional Shinto story of the entrance stone and this alien trying to attack it. And the alien uh, somehow is possessing... And this, you can replace the alien, the word alien with, with deity, right? Shinto deity. This alien or deity is possessing the father of Kafka so that he can die, so that he can go to the underworld. And maybe the worm is his true form and he needs to get the true form through in order to take over uh, the underworld and then eventually the overworld. Uh, all of this I'm making up because Kafka allows that. Kafka allows that. All we know is Johnny Walker had to die to get to the underworld, to wait at that stone for something to come through, and then we know that a white worm crawls out of Nakata's body, which he foreshadowed when he was talking about, I'm hollow, I feel like anything can take me over. Um, a white worm crawls out of Nakata's body and tries to get in uh, to the underworld. That's all Kafka gives us. We know there was some big plan that involved flutes uh, and taking over all kinds of places. We know that, but we don't know... Um, we know how it was foiled, but we don't know the rest of the story. We don't know the morals of it. We don't know anything, um, which is a unique thing to do, but can be very frustrating for people, which is, I think, another reason that this can kind of get uh, uh, bad reviews. So it does leave us with some questions. I do feel like most of the mysteries are solved, but there are a few that uh, I'm still stumped about, that I'm still thinking about. Uh, number one, how did Nakata get to the other world? And of course, that brings up the alien thing. Um, I, I so wanted, and I reread this section hoping, I so wanted the teacher to hide the bloody towels under a rock. Because then Nakata would have gone to, would see the bloody towels and have to lift the rock and open the entrance to get the bloody towels. Which would uh, explain to us how Nakata was left uh, in that other world. That's another thing we wonder about. So was Nakata living, was there a younger version of Nakata living in the underworld the entire time? I believe there was. There has to be because he only has half his shadow just like Miss Saeki. Um... So how did he get there? What opened the underworld at that point? Why did all the kids pass out? And when all the kids passed out, did they see the underworld and have a chance to go and only Nakata was the one that decided to go forward while everybody else came back and, and, and woke up in the, in the world again? Or was it aliens? Did the aliens somehow open the stone and force them all to have this experience again? Uh, this is one of the unsolves. We just have to come up with it, whatever's coolest in our head. Um, we already talked about the bad guy, so I don't need to go into that again. Um, and then again, uh, I just find the, call, the Colonel Sanders part a little bit confusing. Um, and once again, you just have to come up with in your brain what you think the coolest um, explanation of this would be. Okay, that's it. That is Kafka on the Shore and my interpretation and deep reading of it. I hope you got something from this video. I know that there are things in this book that make it very difficult to get through. Uh, and I understand why people love this book so much, but I also understand why people hate it so much. Uh, it all makes sense. And hopefully this deep read uh, will give anybody that's interested a little bit more insight into what the book could be about. I'm honestly kind of happy to let it go. Uh, it's been the last two weeks of my life. I've been living and breathing this book, so uh, um, I really loved it in the end. I really enjoyed it, uh, but I am 
going to be glad to let it go for a while uh, and get on to something else. All right, if you watched this to the end, thank you very much. I know this is a long one. If you like this video, please click like. If you like this kind of co content, please click subscribe. We will be making a lot more of it in the future. Thank you so much for watching.